So George Bowering. George Bowering has been described as an ornery but lovable old literary geezer. <laughs> How do you like that? He's a baseball nut. He used to sell tomatoes. He's written 70 books. He's got a Governor General's Award. He's got an Order of Canada. He's got honorary degrees up the wazoo. He is Canada's first poet laureate. He's paid 12,000 bucks a year. George. Boy. I thought I would um, make a parallel between playing baseball and writing poetry. every once in a while, but I've done that before, lots and lots of times. But I just wanted, there's just, a, the imagery's been bothering me the last two days. I think I'm supposed to pick up on signs, right? So I'm looking at this. I never noticed like that, that. That's not the way my mind works, but. But I'll tell you something. For the last two days, I've been trying to figure out where to put a loony in this to get a Coca-Cola. It's like, their secret, isn't it? We do that in poetry all the time. Like, put stuff in the poem that people aren't going to notice noticing until one of two things happens. Their professor gets them to help notice it, or they wake up in the middle of the night and say, geez, I'd never noticed that before. Right? So, like, signs. I remember the first time I saw this chair. I don't know why I'm doing this. I, didn't, I had no idea what I was going to do when I get up here. So I thought, okay, that's what this chair is all about. Yeah, I remember that. Like, you leaned back like this before. And... <laughs> you know why? Because, like, yesterday, did you see the jacket Moses Neimer had on yesterday? This little white number comes down to here. It's exactly the same jacket my dentist wears. <laughs> Extractions. Now I know, what, I've been wondering what this looks like all the time. Now I know, and a lot of you don't. <laughs> so I thought, okay, well, there's a bunch of my books out in the, in the aisle, and I'm, I'm not gonna tell you to, I'm out in the, but I'm not gonna tell you to buy them or steal them or whatever. I just like, I'm just bringing the fact up because there's about six or seven of them. I'm the poet laureate, right? There's no poetry out there. There's six or seven of my brothers, like a novel, it's a couple of books of short stories, three history books, and my automotive uh, uh, book. I wrote a book uh, on cars, and uh, it tells you how to fix your car and stuff like that. Hmm? Or what I really wanted to do, though, was like talk about what a poet is doing. Like, right, I've become like a history, a popular. No, a popular is not right. Uh, a fiction writer, uh, a history writer of, what's another word for popular history if it's not all that popular? Uh, <laughs> amateur history. So I've written like three history books in a row after having written like four his historical novels in a row. And what I really wanted to do was explain to you why in my new history of Canada, Stone Country, the Battle of the Plains of Abraham is won by Montcalm. You might be able to figure that out from reading the book, but it's not true. But that's what I wanted to do. I asked, as I'm always asking, my publisher, Penguin Books, could I please have the French win at the Plains of Abraham? All my life, the English have won at the Plains of Abraham. <laughs> and not only that, but the guy in the red outfit that dies in Canadian art that led the English, he was like a villain in one of my novels. Right? So could I have him lose in the Plains of Abraham? That's what I really want to talk about, the relationship between history and fiction. But I probably won't have time for that because I know I'm supposed to talk about being the poet laureate. I'm the first ever, it's a lonely, lonely thing. The first, the only poet laureate of Canada 
and the first only poet laureate of Canada. I'm supposed to know what to do? I mean, I don't even get what the poet laureates in other places get. I can't even remember the name of the guy that's a poet laureate of the United States, some kind of corny, ordinary name. I'd never heard of him before he got that job. But, and I know the names of like 750,000 American poets. Right? Billy Collins, that's the guy's name. He gets a lot of money. And, every, and he, his reign goes for like one year, and then he gets like renewed. He gets something like, I don't know, 45,000 American Rasbucknicks, right? I get 12,000 taxable Canadian pesos. That, that's hardly, I mean, the amount of work I have done since I became the Poet Laureate, I've earned that over and over and over again, and I have to pay taxes on it. I haven't got a budget either, but that's not where I was going to start. Here's where I was going to start. The whole story, okay? When I was a little kid, growing up in Oliver, British Columbia, wine capital of Canada, it's called that officially now. If you get the Oliver Chronicle newspaper up in the ear on the left, it says, wine capital of Canada. If you're coming into town, there's a big, huge sign made of old casks, that say, well, new casks made to look old, because the town was begun in 1922, <laughs> wine capital of Canada. I find that particularly delicious because for the coming year, I'm going to be living in the Niagara region. <coughs> and in a couple of weeks, I'm going up to Oliver, British Columbia, wine capital of Canada, and they're going to give me a perk that the English poet gets the in that Ottawa never even thought of. I can, partly the reason they're doing that is because I'm from that town and partly I'm making the deal with them and partly because I whined a lot. The English Poet Laureate gets a sack butt. <laughs> Sounds really rude, doesn't it? A, he gets like a whole pile of red wine, right? I'll tell you another thing the English Poet Laureate gets. He can park in a no parking zone. <laughs> You know what? I would give back the $12,000. <laughs> they let me park in a no parking zone. Isn't that wonderful? Where was I? Oh, yeah. So up in Oliver, they're going to give me a barrel of wine. Wine capital of Canada. The best wines in the country. They're going to give me 300 bottles of wine. And I'm thinking, what will I do? I just sold my house the day before yesterday in Vancouver that I lived in for 30 years. And I'm moving for one year to the Niagara region. They call it the Niagara Peninsula. I don't know. It's not a peninsula. It's not like Florida. Like, so they got like a crick or something going down one end. They call that, I don't know. And so what am I going to do? Now, it happens that my f I have a lot of loyal friends in Oliver and in Vancouver and elsewhere in Toronto that said, it's OK. They'd store them for me. Right? In their basement. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to see if I can get the wine people in Oliver uh, to deliver it to me in the Niagara region. And then my dear darling sweetheart, Jean, and I will have parties. And we'll invite people from all over the region to come to a party. And we'll say, don't bother bringing any wine. <laughs> Yeah. Malicious. So anyway, it all started because I was, I was this little kid growing up in all over British Columbia, and I said, my mother said, what are you going to be if you grow up? And I said, uh, I said, I'd like to be the Poet Laureate of Canada. <laughs> That's true, I did. And she said, I don't know what that is. So I explained it to her. Because, you know, I'd taken Greek and Latin in grades five, and as we did in those days, unlike nowadays, not even with the double helix or whatever you call that, kids going to... <laughs> and uh, my mother said, you idiot, there's no such thing. So I said, okay, um, I'll just have to become something else. And so now I got her. I got her good, right? She's going to come out to this big banquet that they're giving me in all over BC, the, the, Canada, right? And she's going to have to wear, 
She's 86 years old. She's going to have to wear a skirt, a dress for the first time in years and years and years. Okay. Isn't that wonderful? I'm going to be so happy about that. So here's, here's how it happened. A couple years ago, Senator Jerry Grafstein, who's a, a Toronto uh, senator, um, he, he's a very active guy. Uh, Grafstein is always doing something. Uh, to his credit, the first speech he ever gave uh, in the Senate was uh, in favor of, of uh, uh, compensation for uh, the Japanese Canadians who had been put in prison camps during the Second World War. And he's also very, very big on, uh, on Canadian-American friendships since 11-9, or 9-11 as they call it down there. I prefer to use the world system. <laughs> Jerry Grafstein said, you know, we ought to have a poet, uh, poet laureate. We don't have a poet laureate. And now here, Jerry Grafstein is like this. I've talked to various senators. I, uh, for instance, the guy that I went to high school with in Oliver, British Columbia, is now a senator. Uh, owns uh, owns the, the, that last year's award-winning uh, winery in uh, Kelowna. And so I asked them what, is, what Jerry's like. And they, what they do is like every t whenever they see him coming, like he's always got something going, right? And he's always trying to enlist other people to help him get stuff going. Like when they see him coming, they head the other way, right? He comes down and says, hey, would you like to? And they're, they're gone, right? Guys going to the women's washroom in the Senate just to get away from Jerry Grafstein. Wonderful. So he got it. Uh, so he, it took him a, a more than a year. Um, but, oh. Sometime this spring, or one of the many, many times, it is spring when there's snows as high in Ottawa, I think, went up there to Ottawa and I saw a copy of uh, Canadian Notes and Queries, which is normally a little wee thin magazine, this time a big thick magazine. It's got all of Hansard dealing with the argument about having a poet laureate in Canada. Um, and uh, it began in the Senate. Jerry got it through the Senate. Then it went through the house, and there the rule was made. And you get the impression, reading this, that what they really wanted was to say, OK, Jerry, you get it, but now let's just shut up and forget about the Poet Laureate. Right? They wanted it to be really quiet. They didn't want anything to happen. They wanted it to just be kind of an honorary thing, which is what a laureate is. Right? They just wanted me like, to keep my mouth shut and take the $12,000. I also get a few thousand for travel, right? So I can, I can go to Moncton if I want. <laughs> Tourist class. But I decided I didn't want to be, I didn't want to just like let it go. Huh? You could, because laureate means you get the laurels. And actually, uh, friend uh, Jamie Reed, uh, his wife Carol Reed, made me a beautiful laurel wreath, which I put on my head and was photographed uh, wearing. It looks really stupid. And, Lord, and it means, it doesn't mean, like some people think it means, people are always asking me, what do you have to do? Like, do you have to write a poem for, uh, uh, like, Sheila Copps? Right? <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah. Which I would. Like, I mean, if I had my choice among those people that are running for Christian's job, she'd be the one I'd do it for, right? But considering the options. <laughs> Am I allowed to say, that doesn't matter. They're all Ontario people. I'm from, not from Ontario, so I can't get in any trouble. Not yet, anyway. Where was I? <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, so they want to know, do you have to do all these official things? And I said, no. Laurie, it just means keep on doing what you were doing. This is like an award, right? It's sort of like the other awards you get. I didn't realize it took all that much work, but it's mostly self-generated work. I decided I wanted to do some things about poetry. So I decided to have some projects Boy, you should have seen them. They were just like when Jerry Grafstein came by, right? This kind of dissolved into the Ottawa dark. But I persisted. And um, I, I didn't mention that if, if it hadn't been for my dear darling sweetheart, Jean, persuading me to apply for the job, I never would have been the Poet Laureate because here's how it worked. You either applied for the job or somebody else applied for you. And I said, I'm not going to do that. Somebody else can be Poet Laureate. I don't care. Right? But then it was suggested that if I don't look out, Stump and Tom Connors will get the job. <laughs> so I wrote a really good letter, apparently. And I got the job. Okay. So now I decided I want to do some projects. How did this, I thought I was going to like want to quit when I was only five minutes into this thing. 
Why does everybody keep looking down that and telling you about it? I told myself, don't, whatever you do, don't look down at things and say, that, right? Can I get uh, CBC on this? Right. Really would find, like, I got this fantasy baseball team, and I really would like to find out how my infielders did. <laughs> I think so, yeah. So I'll just give you a rundown on a few of the projects, and I won't be able to get into my main topic. <laughs> People always ask me, like, one of the things, I've been so busy, I had to do a lot of things. Like, last week I had to do the Peter Zosky golf course, uh, golf tournament in Victoria, right? I had to, I had to, I've had to go here, there, and everywhere. Like, people, the response has been just incredible. The newspapers have been just incredible. And the people wanted me to come and do stuff all the time. I, only three poems I've written on order were, one, New Year's poem I was asked to do by the Vancouver Sun. Did that gladly. Two, a poem for the Campbell River Writers Festival, because they had won their first year last year by Pat Lane. And I thought, that poem needs a reply, so I did one for that. He doesn't talk to me on the email anymore, but I'll fix that up. And then the third one was a poem for the Peter Zosky Golf Tournament in Victoria last week, in which he got to say really neat things like, regular golfers go to the John Daly. <laughs> a lot of wit, like, like deep wit. That <laughs> I learned that off of my mentor, Charles Olson. Or uh, Bert Shelley, where was I? What was I just, oh yeah, and I got to throw out the first ball in the first home game ever for the Niagara Stars team in the new Canadian Baseball League. They're situated in Welland. They missed the boat. I wanted, instead of calling them the Niagara Stars, I wanted them to be called the Welland Good. <laughs> See, they need a poet as much as I, so it was really neat because I got to throw out the first pitch and the neat thing was the catcher who's, who is, I can't remember his name, he's like a really neat guy and he's from the Dominican Republic. And uh, he flashed me a sign, I shook him off twice. Right? <laughs> then I fired one like that was just knee high on the inside corner of the plate for a right-handed batter. It was perfect, it was ideal, they gave me the ball. And then they, they, they gave away eight copies of my new book from Coach House Press called Baseball. It's in the shape of a pennant and it's green. It's got artificial turf on the cover. It's really quite something. Um, you can pick it up for sixteen fifty, I think, in any good bookstore. <laughs> they were giving that out to, as, as prizes for people who happen to be sitting in the right row. And then the best thing of all, between innings, they interviewed me on the score. Right? I've always wanted to be interviewed on the score. Right? Even more than, like, it was even more fun than the thing I had to do on city TV in Vancouver a couple of months ago at 6.30 in the morning. I can't remember where I was going to go, but I vowed this. I'm a poet laureate of Canada. And he's not. And I get, this doesn't count as notes, does it? Because I'm a poet, right? And the real, okay. I'm going to give you one section out of my automotive book. My co-author was Ryan Knighton. I used to complain when the cars were named after some ferocious animal or bird or fish. Or guns or something. All that U.S. American aggression. But then the Japanese and Koreans or someone took over naming cars. I get all confused after a while because the car will have about four names, like Levanta, Saranta, Nelica, Topaza. If I could find a Barracuda, I would buy it right now. <laughs> so what the hell is an Impreza? I mean, these are the people who started manufacturing clothes, especially shirts and jackets with random English words on them, like, quote, rugby boy, American firefish, elegant, or something. In England, there's an English company doing the same thing. What the hell? I'll tell you one thing. I am never going to drive or even sit in an Alero or an Altima. There is this thing called an Acura legend. Now, if that has something to do with accuracy, since when are legends interested in accuracy? Once I went to a leather jacket store in some Vancouver suburb because it was called Hollywood West. 
isn't Hollywood already in the West? I asked a big, handsome Asian American boy who probably drove an Integra. <laughs> it's just a name, man, was his reply. This legend, though. The word legend might have something to do with reading. Have you ever noticed that there are cars that bear on their rumps the chrome words limited edition? Edition? Okay, these cars have editors now? Is that why they have to be called Lexus? There is a German one called a Passat. Does that signify that it can pass at high speeds? Is that what this is all about? I mean, do these young people with their baseball caps on backward know what all these words signify? George Stanley's advice whenever you get annoyed with a car in front of you is ram him. That's what I want to do when I'm stuck behind something called a Lumina or an Escalade or a Denali. I'm not making these up. Or a Maxima. There is a girl's imitation sports car called a Miata. I'm almost persuaded that that's an actual word in Japanese. I don't know. I'm not going to get started on my other rant about the salesman's term pre-owned. Doesn't that mean brand new, I usually ask them? Some of the U.S. names on cars are as questionable as the Asian ones. Everyone knows what happened to the Nova in Mexico. Spanish Nova means it doesn't go, right? <laughs> Couldn't sell them. And I have always wondered how many women are interested in, in buying a probe? <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.